You mean a sort of retrogression, you think? Uh, no. Uh, I'll bring up a third one on this to illustrate Lady in the Dark. Uh, and that's the taking of the shrew type of thing. Mm. Uh, which, uh, which, this was uh, a wolf house. I hang them of women in the way that... Uh, Man had been handled, but was doing it eminently well, so well that people didn't catch on to what either of these were saying. Yeah, uh, one, you're pointing out a executive role, for instance, which was so uh, well done by these, was so well done the other way, mm. in Lady of the Dark. Uh, the pointing out a dramatic role. When uh, we see uh, how uh, the tearjerker aspect in Minerva was so absurd, and I'm sorry, I'm a pacifist, so I see it as absurd, but, uh, but uh, so absurd that it uh, brought out what she was actually talking about. But uh, drove it home by not dramatic but absurdity. Yeah, well, I think that may be a little bit the way you're seeing it now because, you know, the war was an incredible thing. All of these films, I mean, the women's films and the, the ones that are specifically about the war and the ones that aren't are just full of this kind of emotionalism, and people bought it then. I mean, this is what seems the strangest to us today of all the films of the past, I think, are some of these films. And looking for a job, and she gives him the one side. I mean, it's the whole reversal, and she has him in, and she looks him over and looks at his legs and, you know, plays this game with him, and it's, it's fantastic, and there's no hostility. I mean, it's really playful, and he is not really uh, hum emasculated because you knew the terms that they were acting in. And this, this is what I think a lot of the sort of male and female impersonation in the 30s, so Dietrich and, and Garbo, a lot of times sort of donning male garb, uh, because there was such a sort of security in the roles that they could play around with in this way. Whereas everything became very clinical in the, in the 60s and 70s, and you couldn't have this. <coughs> it was, it was too, just too much sexual uncertainty, I think. Yeah? Well, my friend here was asking me about that, too. He was saying he'd just seen a couple of old Mae West movies, and he said, could she really have been a sex symbol? And she is so outrageous, you know. <coughs> Well, I would say to that that she really enlarges the definition of sex symbol. I mean, she's not, <coughs> she's not somebody that, that men, had, I don't think, had fantasies about. But she was somebody who, who called the shots herself. And she, she could make you believe she was a sex queen. I mean, she said, I, if she said, I'm a sex queen, then she jolly well was. I mean, most of her, her real, I mean, what was really fantastic about her was her verbal wit, really. That's when you look at the movies, and this is really what got her into trouble. She was one of the big reasons for the Hayes office coming down so hard, and oh, good old William Randolph Hearst and Mary Pickford. Apparently, the story goes that Mary Pickford was walking through the great long corridors of Pickfair and heard her niece playing a Mae West song that had some dubious words in it and was so outraged that she immediately called up all the censors and whoever, and, and this is really apparent, supposedly what got the ball rolling and brought it down censorship. And Mae West was making, had put Paramount, for, taken them from the red into the black, and she was a great success. And this really, more or less, she kept on making films, but they were defused. I mean, they really didn't have that punch. But Mae West, she, it's, she's impossible to categorize. She's everything. She's partly female impersonator, she's part male impersonator, and yet she's all woman, and yet she's not like any woman you ever knew. Uh, and all of these people were like they were so they were larger than life. I think she and, and Harlow too. But what was interesting about <clears throat> both her and Harlow 
And as opposed to the, what we consider the sex symbols of the sex goddesses of the, the 60s and 70s was that they were so verbal. They were not just sexual. And Mae West, of course, wrote her own lines. I mean, she was obviously brilliant. But uh, this verbal uh, facility has been lost. I think part of this was the whole idea of sincerity and, and not mumbling and being inarticulate was a sign <laughs> that you were a real person. So this whole <laughs> verbal flair and di the whole act of dialogue was, was gone. But I don't know. What is your, have you seen her? What is your reaction to her? <laughs> oh, well, that's not fair. This is supposed to be a dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think she uh, emasculates him. I mean, he's got a lesser role. Cary Grant or whoever it is is not really as important as she is, and yet they have great dignity. I don't think she robs them of their dignity. Do you? <coughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. The whole leering thing of, yeah, yeah. She really, it's a whole send-up of that male lechery. And what's also, I think, great about her is, you know, you, you have this idea that women are supposed to be devious. or <clears throat> that The one thing they're not is forthright and straightforward and honest. And that one thing she represents is honor. I mean, people are always suspecting her of being promiscuous or, 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 or dirty in one way or another. And she's always very clean and very straight about it. She, she really doesn't play, I mean, the games that she plays are, are, are games that everybody's in on, but she doesn't play any kind of devious, <clears throat> she's not wily at all. And so she has qualities of both sexes. I mean, of course, I think really all of us do. This is the truth, that we do have you know, qualities of, of, of the man and the woman, but so often we felt that they had to be isolated, that a man had to be over-masculine and a woman, I mean, men have suffered too, I think, from a too narrow, vision of what a man should be as well as women. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's about all there is. That's what's so sad. That's really, <clears throat> that's it, I think. As far as I know, oh, she did make uh, the one we were talking about, you know. No. So, anyway was a little film. Uh, I thought she was just great, and, and they shoot ho both, they shoot horses, don't they? Clue was a movie that uh, women really, it seemed to strike a chord. I mean, it, co it was, a, again, you, who wants to, if you looked at it <clears throat> ideologically, <clears throat> maybe you wouldn't want to see a woman playing a prostitute. That's not your idea of the great women's roles. And yet, this was really a very interesting role. It was about a woman trying to hold on to her ego and her, her, her self-esteem and she didn't make it as an actress, but she was trying to do it. As, I mean, it, I thought I, I thought it was really a, a quite a, a startling thing. And that whole scene, the scenes with the woman analyst, I thought were really splendid. The ending was a little ambiguous, and I I met her recently and asked her about it, and she felt that uh, I think you you know she goes off with Donald Sutherland in the end. She felt she would be back to New York in no time. That that wouldn't work out, but she couldn't tell. I don't think from the film it was left open, but that was good in itself. I mean, it didn't say happily ever after necessarily. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, it just make me stick to my title. I've got to, you know. Well, that was what I talked about in the book. That was the scene that I really was thinking of. That and Clockwork Orange. Uh, I think it was outrageous. And men love that scene. I mean, every man I've talked to has thought that was a great turn on. Well, what the, the Newsweek critic wrote about that, this is a scene in Straw Dogs where Susan George has been, I mean, the, to me, this is the ultimate male fantasy of what a, a female, I mean, well, she's prancing around like Daisy May, teasing and taunting these men so that they finally do rape her. And of course, she really loves it, but she hates it. And this scene, this very elaborate scene, was apparently cut from what it originally was, which I'd hate to think. But uh, our Newsweek critic wrote about that. This is a woman's fantasy to be raped. Now, now to me, that is, I have a feeling that that is no woman's fantasy. I think it's a, a man's fantasy of a woman's fantasy. But you see, this is something that... 
Maybe I should leave it. Maybe I should end on rape, huh? <laughs> Since that's what, what I claim to be talking. Well, I think that's a very misogynist picture. I mean, I think those are the two pictures in which women are really violated. I don't think there's been anything quite that bad since then. Those were the two that had just come out when I wrote the book. Please talk about Billy Jack when you talk about rape. Sure. The first Billy Jack. Well, it's really what? Yeah, the woman in Bill, that was about the best thing in it, I thought, was that woman uh, in the first Billy Jack, when she has been raped, and her discussion of her feelings about that. I mean, that was the first time where you really had a woman, and this is something that we're all interested in now. I mean, we, we sort of have to be, because it has become an issue, and yet there's been really very little. The whole idea of women even talking about it, as you know, it's, been, it's just been too much of a taboo, and women have been, have been guilty about something that wasn't even their fault. So in this scene in Billy Jack, yes, that was a, quite a, a splendid monologue where that woman talks about it. I mean, I have other reservations about the film, but I think that was, that was really good. Okay. I hate to cut this off, but using an old show business adage leaves them, I suppose, wanting more and perhaps we could leave with, with rape. Um, on behalf of the ISU Committee on Lectures, I'd like to thank uh, Molly Haskell for being with us and thank you for coming tonight. Thank you.